Stories told about a group of tourists who were kind of upper crust people who were visiting a, a picturesque village in Ireland. And they were walking about the city and noticed an older man sitting on a bench by a fence. And he was kind of looking over the ocean, smoking a little pipe, had a tweed coat on. And one of the ladies in the group, kind of in a patronizing way, said to the older man, I don't suppose there were any great men born in this village. And the man took a puff off his pipe with a twinkle in his eye. He says, a great men, you say? Well, now, no, I think only babies were born in this village. <laughs> and he said that for this reason. There are no instant great men. There's no instant heroes. Maturity, greatness takes time. Perseverance. It's often earned. I mean, you think about Abraham. He didn't start off as a great man of faith. He certainly did not. Moses, he had his faults, his failures. Joshua, David, and let's include this morning, Nehemiah. All these great men of faith grew in their understanding and in their trust in God as they became leaders and men of faith. And so can you. So can I. We mature, we grow, we change. In chapter 1 of Nehemiah, he hears of the distress of Jerusalem. The walls are broken down, the gates are burned. In chapter 1, verse 3, we, we say, And they said to me, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the province are there in the great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates, they're burned with fire. So Nehemiah prays, and there in chapter 1, verse 4, we, we, we find out, so it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. The last five words of chapter 1, and this chapter only has 11 verses, Nehemiah says, I was the king's cupbearer. So here's Nehemiah. Let me have your attention. He hears about his homeland. He hears the distress. He hears the ruin. He hears the situation. And he says, I was the cupbearer to the king. And he's, and he's praying and he's fasting. And, and the time frame between chapter 1 and chapter 2 is four months. Four months pass because he gives the date there, and then he gives the date again. And it says, it came to pass, verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. Cupbearers. They, they, they brought the wine. They, they tasted it before to make sure the food and the wine was not poison. They're, they're well-trained in court etiquette. They were groomed for this position. They were normally handsome men. They were knowledgeable, obviously, of wine. And they had constant contact with the king. Eventually, they would become confidants and friends, even counselors to the king at times, because he spent so much time in his presence. So why did Nehemiah wait four months before he spoke to the king about his situation, as we'll see? Four months he waited and waited. Maybe the king was absent. Maybe he was gone to another place, another uh, one of his palaces somewhere. Maybe, maybe Nehemiah was waiting for a special day when he knew the king would be in a good mood, like Herod on his birthday when he threw a big party and took the head of John the Baptist. 
Maybe he was just waiting for a, a day of celebration when he knew the king would be, you know, open to what he's about to do. Perhaps Nehemiah was looking for an open door. Because God does have, and I'm sure you're aware of this, timing in our life. And sometimes we're called to wait. Sometimes we're called to, to just wait upon the Lord. I remember in my own life about three or four months before we started the church here, I had no idea what I was going to do. Bible college graduate, seminary, in a, in a difficult position, not knowing which way to go. And I literally, for three or four months, prayed. My wife and I would take long walks. We'd pull weeds in our backyard. We'd talk over the future. And God led us by His Spirit and, and a, a crazy amount of details, but we, we can't go there, to, to go to San Diego and meet this pastor who was a pastor of Calvary Chapels. I'd never even really heard of Calvary Chapels. But God's timing was so good. And I came back after meeting this guy and thought, well, we'll give it a year. God has timing. He has seasons, a time to plant, a time to water, a time to grow, a time to harvest. And I think sometimes we need to wait. Wait till God confirms. Wait till God opens the door. Wait till, till we see, okay, God, I, I see you're affirming this. You're confirming this. An old friend of mine died not long ago, and I had the privilege and honor of doing a memorial service for him on the beach. He was a well-known surfer around here. In fact, he was the guy who introduced my older brother, who became a pro surfer, into surfing. Let him use his surfboard for the very first time. He was not a believer. And I was kind of trying to figure out, how, how do I speak to this group of surfers who most of them, I'm sure, don't know the Bible, they don't know the Lord, but God, you've given me this, this place to speak, so help me. And so I got up and I asked them a question. I said, how many of you remember the band, The Birds? They all went, yeah, because they're all old geezers like me. Yeah, we remember the birds. I said, remember that song they used to have, to every season, turn, turn, turn? Yeah, we remember that. I said, did you know that was in the Bible? They're like, what? I said, yeah. So I opened up the Bible to Ecclesiastes, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time to weep. See, I think after Nehemiah prayed for four months and fasted and waited, Nehemiah is looking for an open door. God, God when, when should I step forward? When should I, when should I ask the king what I need to ask him? And Back to verse 1, it came to pass in the, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. And I'd never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, hey, why is your face sad? You're not sick. This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and, and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lie in waste and its gates are burned with fire? Regardless of personal issues or circumstances, the king's servants were never supposed to look sad in his presence. They were never to look down before him. See, you're in the presence of the king, and that alone should provide joy and gladness of heart. That's what they thought. It's kind of like today. You're here, and I'm speaking. You should be happy. You should be glad. <laughs> well, this is what the king thought. Man, if you're in my presence, you should have a big smile on your face. What more would you want out of life? Also, it was a capital offense to look sad in the presence of the king. 
You could be put to death for being sad or unhappy in his presence. That's why it says in verse 2, I became dreadfully afraid. The king notices sadness, not sickness. He sees sorrow. Nehemiah has been praying. He's been fasting. He's been waiting on the Lord. And the king initiates a conversation. He doesn't condemn. He asks a question. And God is, is, is now doing something that, well, that Nehemiah has been praying and fasting for. You know, in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, there's a, there's a verse that says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And God's doing this right now with Nehemiah and with this king. After praying, after waiting, after fasting, he's in his presence. He can't help be sad. He's heard this news. And the king initiates, and, and this is the deal now. He realizes something's about to happen, and he's a little timid. He's a little afraid. In fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Nobody. And so here's God. He set up this whole scene for Nehemiah. He's got him as the cupbearer. He's brought the news to him. He's fasted. He's waited. He's prayed. And now it all comes down to this very important opportunity. In the back of my mind, as I'm reading this, I'm saying, don't blow it, Nehemiah. Don't blow it. Recognize what's going on in your life right now and step into it. See what the Lord will do. You know, let me, let me just say something about God ruling the hearts of kings and he's stronger than anyone else. God's in control of our nation, of who sits in the Oval Office. God turns the rivers in the hearts of leaders. Yes, we pray. Yes, we do our part. But we serve God first. We, we render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. We understand Nehemiah prays, but God also works through ungodly men. He did so with Pharaoh. The scripture says that God showed his power through Pharaoh. The scripture tells us that Cyrus, that ungodly king, helped deliver the Israelites from Babylon. God's not required to just use believers. He'll use whoever he wants. And God has his timing. He, 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 he has his seasons and he tears up and he plants and... It, 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 our situation that we're going through right now, as I look at it, as I pray about it, as I think through it, as I listen, we're, we're in a global pandemic. That, did you hear that first word? Global. We're in a global citizenship right now all over the world because of nuclear power, because of economy, because of disease and all the travel that goes on, because of communication. And I would encourage you, as I'm encouraging myself and my wife, let's be all about Jesus and the kingdom of God and eternity. And, and let our hearts be at a place where we wake up in the morning and go, okay, Lord, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and let you add all the rest. That's what he does. So Nehemiah, working in an ungodly court, he's serving wine, comes to this place. And verse 3, he says to the king, may the king live forever. You know why he says that, right? Because if you have to taste the wine, and then the king gets it, you want him to live forever. Because you're drinking that stuff too. So that's a common phrase. May the king live forever. That was a common phrase for the cupbearer. See, here's the deal. Well, you hope and you're enthusiastic about this king surviving. So now Nehemiah answers the question that the king gives to him. 
with a question. Why should not my face be sad? This is something that comes from the background of Nehemiah. This is the way rabbis would always answer a question with a question. He's, he says, uh, why are you sad? He says, well, why should my face not be sad? The city, the place of my father's tomb, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. He doesn't mention the name of the city. He doesn't mention Israel. He, he very cleverly and, and, and very astutely talks about his ancestors, his, the burial grounds, the tombs, the walls. He, he, he's playing this card very well. And then the king said to me, what do you request? Now the door is wide open. Oh, it cracked for a while. Why are you so sad? It's, it's, it's leading up to this, this situation. And now all of a sudden, the king says, well, what, what, do, you, what do you need? And, and Nehemiah, he, I'm sure he's, so I prayed to the God of heaven. It doesn't mean he dropped on his knees and started saying, oh, blessed God of heaven. No, he, he has one of those like, you know, you're, you're, you see a cop pull up behind you and you're praying. Like it's one, of, it's one of those kind of prayers. He's praying. God, here, here I go. I'm stepping into it. He's, he's asked for, for, for a request. It's like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that, that great verse that says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to find help in the time of need. He's deep in the time of need. And so, you know, it's that, it's that kind of, you know, praying while you're talking to someone, Lord, help me get through with them. Help, help me talk to them. Help me open their eyes. That's what's going on. Nehemiah had already prayed for months. But Nehemiah also had a plan. Then the king said to me, verse 4, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. The first thing he says is, send me, send me. And then he goes on in verse 7, Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they may, may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. And when Sanballat and the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. First he said, send me. And then he said, give me. Send me and give me. That's what he said to the king. After all this time of praying and now coming to the place where God opens the door, he says, okay, this is the plan. This is what I feel like I need to do. Send me, and not only send me, but give me the resources to do what needs to be done. You know, there's a simple but powerful phrase that's kind of shared between pastors about those in their congregation are on their staff who want to start churches. It has to do with leadership and authority and timing. And here's the, here's the little phrase that's passed around pastors about those from within who go and start churches. Some are sent and some just went. Maybe you've seen it. It's kind of like the difference between a legitimate birth and an illegitimate birth. You know, when a, when a, when a child's going to be born and it's a legitimate birth and the parents are married and they have showers and everybody's happy and talking about it and giving gifts, 
It's a wonderful thing. But when it's an illegitimate birth, well, there's all kind of whispering. No one really knows what's going on. Are, are they having a baby? What's happening? I don't know. Are they married? I don't, I don't know. It's that way with churches sometimes. Some, some, some are sent. Some just went. Some are legitimate. And some of them, nobody really knows kind of what's going on. Well, Nehemiah says this, I want to be sent, and I want you to provide for me as I go. And he sent, listen, he sent with authority. It, it reminds me of uh, Jesus when he, when he sent his men out in, in Matthew. I'm sure you know the passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter uh, 28, it talks about Jesus sending out his men. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. And he prefaced it by saying this, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I'm going to send you, and I'm going to equip you. No description really is given in Nehemiah of the trip from Susa to Jerusalem. But it took about two months. There's two months travel that expires in, in chapter 2. When he, when he does arrive, he, his entourage, because he sent soldiers with him and all this group to go with him with letters to pass through, uh, three enemies oppose his reason for coming. There's Sanballat, there's Tobiah, and over in verse 19 of, of chapter 2, th there's another person who's, who's mentioned, uh, Geshem. So you've got this, this opposition. And the enemy always wants to oppose the restoration and rebuilding of stability, maturity, and security of God's people. And this is what's happening. This is what's going on. God has opened a door. He's provided. He's sent. And as soon as they get there, there's opposition. But I also want to say this. God wants to use you and I to serve because that's what Nehemiah was. He was a servant. He was a cupbearer. He did his duties. He prayed. He fasted. God wants to use us to serve, to pray, to wait on him, to walk through open doors, and to do the work of the ministry. This is the picture here of Nehemiah. He, he, he goes from this, this position of being a servant Praying while he's serving God, there's probably more that you want me to do than just serve the king wine and be his confidant. I, 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 I bet he thought it was a great job, but he felt like when he heard this news, maybe God will use me. And I would encourage you, as I encourage myself, when you hear about something that needs ministry to or help with, you should, you should pray, God, maybe you want to use me. Instead of thinking of the person, I think God should use him or her. You know, I love the story, and I'll read you part of it, of a man who typifies this in the New Testament. His name was Philip. Maybe you know Philip's story. In the book of Acts, it says, in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews, against the Jews, by the Hellenists, the Greeks, because they didn't think their widows were getting the proper attention in the church that they should, that the Jews were just ministering to the Jews. So the twelve, the disciples, summoned the multitude of them together and said, it's, it's not for us to, to serve the tables, we're, we're, we're teaching, we're, but seek from among you men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, and we'll appoint them over this business, and we'll give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. And the second person they chose was a man named Philip. So Philip starts off his ministry serving food, tables, to Greek widows. That's his job. And then persecution comes on the church. And it tells us later, as Saul was making havoc of the church, entering houses, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered, the the persecution takes them out of Jerusalem. And they went everywhere preaching. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, now let me have your attention. Here's Philip. He's just serving tables. He's a cupbearer, so to speak. God, God gave him that role. He, he, heard, he heard they needed someone. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He, he was a reputable guy. He was usable. God said, okay, here, let's let Philip. And then he goes down to Samaria, preaches Christ to them. And a multitude with one accord heeded the thing spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing miracles which he did. And multitudes heeded it. And unclean spirits were cast out. People were healed, paralyzed, and lame, and there was great joy in the city. Wow. I'm a table server in bread. Persecution arises. Lord, where do you want me to go? He goes down to Samaria. God uses him powerfully. And then it tells us, and an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. What's up with Philip? Arise, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. There's a desert. So he went and he saw a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her money. And he came to Jerusalem to worship and he was returning and he was sitting in a chariot and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, go near, overtake the chariot. So Philip ran. He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So you got the picture? Serving tables. Becoming a a powerful uh, evangelist in Samaria. To now being in the desert with this very influential person who, who probably takes the gospel back to Ethiopia, and he's reading about Jesus from Isaiah. He goes, I don't understand this. Could you help me? Could there be a bigger open door than that? It would be like you sitting at the mall and someone pulls up in a limo. It's, it's Donald Trump or some Joe Biden, whoever, and they're reading John three sixteen, and they say, hey, do you know who this is talking about? He's talking about himself or someone else. Could you come in and help me? No, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I'm picking up some Nikes. No. God had timing. God had position. Starts off as a servant. He begins to, to pray. God opens doors. He, he sent. Because here's the deal. And I believe this with all my heart. If you'll do your part, God always does his part. He always does his part. He's just looking for people to serve. He's just looking for people to pray. He's just looking for people who wait on his timing and recognize an open door, that they're not so busy and distracted by life. that Well, who cares? Well, that's not Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 2, we, we pick up the story in verse 11. I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. I'm there for three days. And I rose in the night. I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode, and I went out by night. And it describes him going 
through the city, through the gates. He's looking at all the gates and all the walls. In verse 17, I said to them, you see the distress we're in? How Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire? Let's build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Why are we living like this? Like, like we have no God, like we have no resources. Let's rise up. Build, and they set their hands to this good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at all of us, despised us. What is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself is with us or will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right our memorial in Jerusalem. Nehemiah surveys the situation. He knows God's with him. He's been there three days. And he believes, okay, I've been here three days now. It's time to get to work. He lets the Lord speak. He lets the Lord confirm. And, and I want you to to kind of dial in here for a minute and listen to me. So I'm about to just finish this up. You say this early? Yeah. It's Valentine's Day. Three days he waits. There's ridicule. There's opposition. But he believes it's time to get to work. And I want to encourage you for the next three days to take a look. Oh, not, not at the bridge or things that are broken down. I want you to take a look for the next three days at your own life. Examine it. Are there any doors you've left open? Are there any walls in your life that have been broken down where the enemy has come in? Are there things in your life that you've began to dabble in again? I would encourage you, I would encourage us, take the next three days and look at your spiritual life. What's it like? Just, just walk around it for a little bit. How's the serving going? How's the praying going? How's the time in God's word going? How's, how's the lifestyle that you're living? Is it honoring to God? Take three days and look at yourself. How's the marriage? Are you doing anything to make it better? Or are you just blaming the other partner? How's the parenting going? Are you invested in it? Are you doing anything with it as a mom, as a dad? How's the job? Are you a light there? Or are you one of the whiners? The walls and the doors. The, the ways into your life. Are you allowing the, the condemnation, the ridicule of the enemy to say, oh, you can't do this. There's no way you can ever be anybody. There's no way you could ever be used. <laughs> I'll never forget, I, I went into ministry with, with fear and trembling. Still do. I was shy. I was the middle child. I had a kind of semi-famous brother who was a surfer. and uh, I, was the, I was not the... Uh, well, I wasn't the leader. And I remember my second year in Bible college, I came home and my mom and uh, my, my brother's uh, mother-in-law, they owned a florist shop together here in uh, Gulf Breeze. And I would deliver flowers to make extra money, work in my brother's shop a little bit. And I'll never forget sitting in the back of the florist shop one time and I was loading up the car to deliver some flowers. And, and my mom was a little concerned. I was in my second year of Bible college and she goes, John, are you sure that's what you want to do? Be a pastor or missionary? And I go, I don't know, Mom, I'm, I, I think. And she goes, well, I don't know if I really see you that way. Do you care about people? <laughs> and I thought, I don't know. 
But the enemy will test you and try you and come at you. There's walls that need to be built in our life and doors that need to be established. The enemy will, will come like, like he did to Nehemiah and say, <laughs> you know, who are you? He, he laughed at us and he despised us, he said. That's, that's a pretty good evidence of the enemy's techniques as he condemns and laughs. You say, well, John, what are, what, are, what are broken walls? What are torn down doors? Well, I think one big one is unforgiveness. The Bible says that, that unforgiveness is, is something that allow you to, to build a, a, a root of bitterness that will begin to defile many. And maybe these next three days, you can think about, who is it that I just can't forgive? God would say, maybe you start praying, you start fasting, you start looking for an open door. And if you'll do your part, here's what I believe. God will do his part. Prayerlessness is a broken wall. It's a burned door. Oh, I used to pray. I used to believe God would answer my prayer. I don't pray anymore at all. I'm too busy watching TV and YouTube and all this. I don't pray really. I'll pray when we come to church. Prayerlessness. There's power in prayer. God answers prayer. Why do you think Nehemiah fasted and prayed for all that time and then stepped into a situation and when the door was wide open, he prayed again? Okay, God, here I go. How's the prayer life? Another broken wall, another burned out door is lack of fellowship. Oh, it's just me coming into church, sneaking in, sneaking out. See, without fellowship, there's no accountability. Without fellowship, there's great vulnerability. See, the, the, the wolf always goes after the lone sheep who keeps himself separated because that, that lone sheep thinks, well, I'm the only one going through this. I'm the only one that has this problem. I'm, no, you're not. Look around you. These are all sinners here. There's none righteous. No, not one. And all of us, whether we are willing to admit it or not, we have problems with our kids. We have problems with our wives, our husbands, our neighbors. We got some problems. And we need fellowship. I, I, I host a small group in my house, and we, we share things. And you know what? We all got issues. We need fellowship. Lack of fellowship is a broken wall, a, a burned door. A disobedience is one. Walking in a way that you know God can't honor, that you know God can't bless. Whom the Lord loves, he also chastens. He reproves. Bitterness and prayerlessness, unforgiveness, disobedience. Pride's another one. Oh, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if we're not careful, we can think of ourselves so highly and so above others, and, and God just wants us to, to humbly come to him and be a servant. That's how Nehemiah started. That's how Philip started. That's what Jesus said. He says, the greatest among you will be the servant of all as they were discussing who was the greatest. And Jesus is trying to rebuild some walls. Another broken wall is the unwillingness to listen to wise counsel or God's word, to be in the truth, to recognize condemnation versus conviction. Th those are broken down walls and broken down doors that, that open your life to the enemy. See, let me suggest, this is a, a great pattern, I think, when he comes to the place where he, he, God has sent him and spoken to him about and equipped him and, and prepared him. He says, I'm going to take three days and examine this. Three days and look around at the walls and the doors. And, and, and wouldn't it be great if you and I took three days and just said, okay, God, let me really look. 
and my spiritual life. Because I guarantee you there are those among us who have opened doors and broken walls where the enemy has come in through drugs, he's come in through alcohol, he's come in through all kinds of different ways, touched our lives.